So hi, Max. Now the most important question, of course, is what was your first computer? My first computer? The, fir I, I, the first computer I owned was a Commodore 64. But the first computer I actually like, saw and touched and kind of triggered the whole getting into computers was uh, my, um, uh, my uh, what's it called? Uh, one of my friends, when I, I can't remember how old I was, like maybe 10 or 11, had a mother who was working in a, in a like the play, play they make uh, newspapers. Okay. And uh, she, she got a green terminal at, at home to get used to a computer. Because at that time, it wasn't regular. It wasn't normal to have a computer at home. And I saw the screen screen, and I got to type on it, and then I was hooked, <laughs> basically. <laughs> Seeing the stuff, when I typed letters on my keyboard, and it moved on the screen, that was that what got me hooked. And then, uh, yeah, I got the Commodore 64 uh, mainly just for playing games. But then there was this thing called Basic on it, and, uh, yeah, I, I think I made a, what's it called, a, a print hello world go to 10 a hundred times. Uh, and that's how I started programming. Okay, basically uh, the uh, the green screen. Why why, why you like yeah. that? Well, I, I it was just you know I it was something when you the fact that you know I hadn't touched anything like that before, right? And then just the fact that you were touching a keyboard and the key was going down and something reacted on the screen. I don't know. That was just like I still remember the day that that green letters moving when I typed in. Okay, cool. Um, I think I was like, yeah, nine or ten. It was just fascinating for me for some reason. <laughs> okay. So and um, and, and uh, how old were you with the C sixty four? I think I was eleven or something. Eleven, okay. or twelve. Yeah, yeah, around that. Um, and then uh, it was mainly a game. I think I, I got it. Um, and uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, Amiga. Yeah. Uh, uh, oh, uh, uh, yeah. Okay, but C sixty four was already great back then. And which games you liked? Yeah. You remember the games? Oh, uh, oh, what's it called? The one that I played the most uh, it's called Rally, I think. It's like okay. the, you, you're playing this eight bit pixel game from the top, and there's like two two joysticks. You had like your friend had one, the other one ha you had one, and you played around on this like track, and you could slide uh, uh, in the in in the in the curves and, and go around. I think it's called like Rally or something. Okay. And international karate, I remember. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, I can, yeah, a lot of fighting games is what I remember. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I wanted to have one game, uh, and this was only available on C sixty four, and I had set Spectrum, and the game, the name of the game was Mac Max. It, uh, it ah, was like okay. it was like a robot, you know, going and shooting, and you can build the robot, and this was actually an interesting game, but it's only available on C sixty four. I remember. So um yeah. Ah, okay. Uh the question yeah. is, uh why you started programming then? So I mean you had the you had the games, you were happy with the games, it seems like. Yeah, well I I just remember at some point there was this manual with the Commodore sixty four and it talked about this, you know, basic stuff. Um and there was like this explanation of a of a sprite. And it took me I it took me forever to understand it. Like I I I just couldn't get how it worked. Uh but I remember typing in these like, you know, there's a mag magazine in, in Denmark called IC Run, which like was about you know Commodore 64 and, and all that stuff. And you could like these pages you could type in just like a little bootstrap on top, and then you just say data, and then you're just typing in all the basically the the <laughs> the bytecode kind of thing. Um, and out came a game or some animation, and I was like, I couldn't understand like how could people like like know which numbers that should be on that uh, in that uh, yeah, exactly. It took me years, to, oh, not years, it took me a long while to realize this was actually like a compiled result of an actual game written in in an assembler or, or something else. Um, but I remember I, I got into uh, basic somehow this way, and I remember doing the Hello World, and I said, like little animated sprites you could draw, mm -hmm. um, like that's like a piece of paper, you should make the dots, and then you should, you know, calculate which the, the bit pattern, and and you make this balloon that was uh, flying around. And somehow I got into, like, that was, at that time, just too complicated. I couldn't, like, I couldn't connect. I could do what it said, but I couldn't understand what it was doing. And then I, I uh, found... So the, uh, the numbers is funny. Snake. I had the same the same problem. I had, uh, you know, yeah. the peek and pokes. And uh, I yeah, was... Exactly. I, yeah, I was... Uh, 
how it's possible that, that someone, you know, knows the number. So I was, it, yeah. it drove me crazy. It's like, this is just yeah. a mission impossible. So how would they do it? So yeah. is this like, you know, so, extremely smart people or, or, I mean, this is just impossible. If someone just says, do this peak and they poke and, you know. Um, yeah, the, 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 the thing that get, the next one was like a, a, the, the snake game, you know, like a, yeah, yeah. you move the mm -hmm. snake around. A bit. That one, that source code was actually with your Commodore 64 somehow. Um, oh, and I remember you could go in and edit uh, you could change this. Like I looked at the code, because I learned basic basics, and then I saw the code, and I got in and I changed the fact that you know it it will just keep growing. I could change how it grow, and I could make the game more fun mm -hmm. that way. And that was the first time I learned the power of open source, basically, because I'm like <laughs> I could couldn't understand all the text that was like that explained to me how a sprite work and animation. I was like made no sense to me. Yeah. But looking at the source code and being able to play around and get fast feedback, that was what made it for me. Yeah. Um, and, what, what's uh, still yeah. one, one thing which interests me? So uh, you were happy with the games, but there was a manual. So why you read the manual then? I mean, you could just keep playing games, you know? Well, sure. But I was ten or eleven, and I, I, you know, learned to read read a few years before, and just you know, if there's a book, then you start reading it and go like, okay, let's see what this is. And yeah, cool. Now the there was a time when, you know, a manual was actually interesting. There was actually in, informal, informational stuff in there and not just uh, go online and, and find yourself uh, things. But, yeah, it was just, yeah, reading and trying to understand it. So. Yeah, cool. So uh, you got uh, you you got then Amiga, right? Where, where was it, actually? Which city you lived back then? I, I was in, um, I, I'm from Denmark, so I lived in a small country village called Vilbeck. Oh, cool. Outside on the western side of... of 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 uh, of Denmark, and you were alone uh, with your computer, or were you, uh, other you know uh, 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 kids also had computers? Uh, yeah. So my my the friend I was playing games. Oh, oh so that's now I remember like the rally game and uh, uh, summer Olympics. Yeah, like you move the keyboard, like the joystick, like yeah, you this was a joystick destroyer, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. And I remember shopping for the like the most. Uh, <laughs> The strongest joystick, so yeah. it could survive. Um, I, was, I had a friend there that was playing. That was had had a Commodore sixty four too, and we kind of it was our social, <coughs> sorry, our social uh, thing. And uh, yeah, and then I remember we got we had on our school. We were like every year that was when you were in the sixth grade, or set, like sixth or seventh grade. Mm -hmm. That year, that the school paper for that school will be made by that that uh mm -hmm. that year and i that was one of the first time they were using a com uh, the commodore 64 had a, a word processor what was called word perfect mm -hmm. um and i remember i was only i only had that at school i couldn't use that at home um and i just remember i was the one who understood how that worked so i was kind of one teaching the other kids how to use the word perfect and why you got it because you, you used it before or no, it was just that was the thing that was the school was using. They, you know, the teacher has been so. Hey, you can use this okay. thing, and here is this uh, matrix printer. <laughs> and then we made the we had the um, uh, we we wrote the 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 articles and and whatever it was on the on the on the Commodore sixty four. Uh, I think it was Commodore sixty four. And then somehow it got printed in a nice format, but that was like you had to send that somewhere. You couldn't. You didn't. The school couldn't afford a printer that could do it nicely. So, okay. Yeah. Yeah, and and uh, the yeah. Amiga five hundred. So you already had it, or the well, the Amiga. Uh, I think there was so the Commodore sixty four was like a, a used one. My parents bought for me in, in a birthday present or something. Um, and then uh, the 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 Amiga, I got uh, some few a few years later. And here I was trying to get into like the like some of my friends was doing like. Um, Assembly and stuff for you know uh, demos and uh, land games and all this this whole demo scene, and again, but I was back again to being I had no idea what they were doing. It was back was, then. When were, was it the demo scene? This was I've been I've been what I've been I've been like fourteen, fifteen. So that's like thirty years ago. Wow. That's okay. 15, Incredible. Uh, yeah. Um. But the thing is, again, that was the, the, the thing I hated there was like, 
there was these guys who had figured this out. They understood the numbers and the assembly and whatever it was. <laughs> exactly. But they were so protective okay. about what it was. Like, it was so hard to find information. There's no, you couldn't, there's no Google or anything you look up. Like, how to, it was all word of mouth. Mm-hmm. Um, and it took me, it was, uh, it was just horrible. And I remember the, uh, trying to find stuff and, and um, get access to information was like a battle. You have to know the people and they have to be, you know, yeah. nice to you and all that stuff. Um, and I just remember at some point I got like this big Turbo, <clears throat> Turbo Pascal book um, about object-oriented programming. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and that was the one that, that it, for some reason, that one made it click for me. I suddenly... Like, I understood, like, go-to and basic stuff, like for loops and while loops mm-hmm. um, and that kind of thing. But method calls, I, I kind of got. And then th- this was this whole object-oriented programming. And that was, that blew my mind. It was just, uh, yeah. But it was only because I had the book and I could try Tool Pascal. Uh, that was actually, th- at that time, I got a, a, a 486. I got a, a PC at that time. So it was a few years later. Um and then I just sat down and I I went through that book like ten times, and suddenly go like, oh, I can build like small console apps in my my DOS program with Tool Pascal. And later on, I got into Delphi, uh, Visual Basic, Microsoft Access, all those um, uh, wonderful things. Um, and uh, yeah, and then then I got, did some C, and I, and then suddenly I end up doing Java. Uh, at university, and I, I did a li- literal. My product there was a it's called elucidated programming, which was like a variation of literate programming. One question: So, uh, which which software do you yeah. brought? So, what is your first piece of software? Somehow interesting, you know. So, you you did a lots of research, but what was your goal? I mean, what you wanted to achieve it was, right? It was just this thing that I could control, like like that little. I press a key and at the green screen, the cursor moves on the green screen. And then I go, hey, I can do, I can move more things. Like, mm-hmm. I can make it move around. I can make it print. I can make, put it switch in the graphics mode. And just the fact that I could control and manipulate that little world, um, and make it do things. And then it just kind of built from there. Mm-hmm. Um, and I can't, I don't actually think. I think I was, I was literally just, I was just trying to understand how those numbers in IC run worked. <laughs> like, okay. where did they come from? Uh, <clears throat> And it was just random, like small uh, utilities or programs. And um, but I spent most of my like younger was just trying different applications and not so much program. Program was just kind of on or off. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, the the big the first big thing I think I can remember doing, um, as those those the basic you know changing the basic programs. But the the first big thing I did was in in um, I went to um, oh, what's that called the English. Uh, well, it was an IT uh, uh, study, and you have uh, to go and uh, make an app. Yeah, so engineering, right? Like electrical engineering, something like this. No, well, no, it was, it was actually it was one of the first courses in Denmark that had to do. It's not it's not computer science on university, but like before. But um, so it's a higher education, but but um, just for for IT. It's an IT uh, okay. school. It's like the third or fourth year that they had uh, this this thing. Um, and I just remember that I, I wrote, a, it was Microsoft Success. I wrote an application, um, a lot of stuff to do with, uh, I, I was fascinated about databases. So querying from a database and mm-hmm. visualizing it and that kind of thing. So I wrote an app to manage, uh, there was like a gallery, like a, a little store in this gallery in this, this town I was in. And I needed an application to manage all his artwork. Thank and uh, I just remember writing that as a, as a, 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 a thing back then. Um, and then I actually got a, a study job next to it uh, with the, a company who who did um, who is producing uh, what's it called underwear, underwear okay. and lingerie and 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 like uh, any med- like the fabric you use when you protect yourself like okay. uh, medical fa- and uh, those machines has a certain pattern like these are like mechanical like it's like it's like a um, what's it called a, a punch card like you you okay. put uh, different uh, patterns. And then out comes the pattern for your lingerie or for your medical thing. And that system, they had a very massive spreadsheet. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it was just over, it was just too much. It was just too hard to look up. Um, so I, I imported all that data into 
uh, Microsoft Access. And then when I've done that, they suddenly go, oh, they can do this very fast. They now wanted to do it visually. So this, so I drew, made up this in visual basic on Microsoft Access. I made this very crude UI to say, okay, you want to do a line there and a, hey, cool. a stitch there and then, and then that stored in database. And, and the fun thing that I, I don't know if it's running still, but I, I was, uh, I came by that company like five, six years later and they were still running. So as uh, it, was it your first job? Yeah, that was my first, uh, like, uh, but it was like a side gig to my school. I studied at that time. Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah. And then after that, I, I, I got recommended to do, uh, a full master's in computer science. Yeah. Hey, wait, one second. How you got the job? Uh, that was because I was on, uh, on that school. I became, oh, okay. uh, I was, I was the, like, uh, every year had a, had a student that was kind of like, um, working for, with the teachers. Mm -hmm. uh, do, I, I helped uh, some people understand pointers and other stuff uh, and so I was like a teacher assistant kind of thing Okay. Um, and then uh, a si and system admin kind of thing so I helped I remember having to install they were doing small talk uh, they, small talk came around and they had these and it required like 8, eight megs of memory which mm -hmm. was or 16 I forgot it was like 4 times more than normal mm -hmm. and I was installing all those were like into like twenty, uh, forty-six uh, PCs, tower PCs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I just remember installing OS two on those to have uh, the small talk visual age <laughs> uh, tooling install. Um, and I just remember, I think there was like uh, this. Uh, the company asked the the, uh, the school if they had some students who might be able to do have a student project, okay, uh, or a student job. And and that was that was how I got into it. Um, yeah, and then, yeah, that's, 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 that's the one I did. I also did, oh, no, that was before my, that was Actually, the, I'm, I'm just, just an observation because your, yeah. uh, your colleagues, uh, in your younger age didn't want to share anything, right? So you, you were the opposite. Yeah. You say, yeah, now <laughs> I show you how it works and you shared whatever you yeah. could, right? <laughs> I, it, yes. It was, it was, I was so frustrated that it was so hard to find information. I was yeah. Like, Anytime I found something and someone, I was like, yeah, you should like, this is how we do it. Um, so no, it was, uh, it was, it, it was, uh, yeah. I, I remember the first years, I was like, yeah, messing with me. I couldn't find it because the thing is you can go to school and you could learn about, you know, you know, science yeah. and, uh, you can read from a book, like the stuff that's been published the last, you know, 10, hundred thousand years, but this new, new thing in quotes that was happening the last, you know, 20, 30 years, and oh, well, that time was like 20 years in, 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 in IT, it was just incredibly hard to find. Yeah. And um, the people who were doing it was very protective yeah. the, of the thing. So, no, so what was your was next thing after Visual Basic? So you, 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 you created, you know, the what you see is what you get tool with Visual Basic? Yeah. Uh, <coughs> uh, what did I do afterwards? I did some Delphi, again, a student pro uh, uh, programming in, in, in Delphi, and I love Delphi. Delphi was like, like the visual thing and the wiring up things and the fact that, that behind the visual thing was actually a decent program model. Mm -hmm. um, I found amazing and I still regret that Borland messed mm -hmm. up whatever they had. I, and I'm still, I, I read a few times on, on, they still exist, which is funny. Like Delphi is still a thing. Um, but Yeah, actually, uh, yeah, I they, attended they, some they conferences in Germany and uh, the yeah. conferences, this was like, uh, it was called, I think, Entwickler conference so it's like developer con and yeah. uh, this was uh, some this was at the beginning or beginning this was i would say five or eight years ago something like this this was a joint conference between java and delphi programmers and the delphi oh, programmers yeah. yeah they were extremely passionate about you know j builder uh, j sorry j builder the boland and the oh. uh, delphi and and they're still running yeah. so there were people from switzerland so uh, and they used delphi in the government and they, they were like a gurus you know and they showed me from boland like uh, videos or whatever they were ex as passionate as we are about java they were passionate about delphi yeah, and, and I, now I just I remember because the the the, the thing that uh, Sun did back then they came out with yeah Gay Builder or something similar, so which was very much inspired by Delphi. Like it was mm -hmm. it was literally the same UI, yeah, and all these beans and stuff. But where, and I think the difference was that uh, Java seemed to be more open 
about what they did and allowed for more like others to add stuff on top and mm -hmm. then uh, yeah so so delphi just kept kept you know increasing the price for the software and i think uh, it was just yeah they they made a mistake so they they had some re like i still believe like the most productive i've been in like combined ui and back end stuff was was when i did uh delphi um uh but i also like yeah it, 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 i just remember it very fondly <laughs> sitting okay. and doing those things um and then i got into um what was the next thing i guess yeah, I got to university. I did some Java and some C. Uh, how you like Java? So, what things. was your first Java version, and how you like Java? So, how? I, so I, I thought I think it must have been like Java one point two or something. Okay. It was. Um, I tried. I tried. I remember Oak and Squeak or whatever they were before. Just as like they were things I just kind of mm -hmm. touched and saw at some point. Um, but I think Java one two was the thing I used in my. Um, my real work. I got a, a a job at a company called Metfork, who's actually a sister company called Trifork, who ah. did some of the first Java E application servers. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so I worked with that uh, that company. I actually and know the guy who moved around the conferences and uh, and try to you know to promote the, the Trifork. What was his name? So he was uh, uh, all uh, around. There's, there's, there's Jörn and uh, uh, Kirsten. Uh, yeah, Kirsten. Uh, uh, yeah. Kri yeah. Yeah, he's this thin guy with a big, uh, big hair. <laughs> I, I think so, so. Yeah, he moved around yeah. and, uh, yeah. and and uh, he organized once a conference in Monaco or somewhere about the Trifork. I yeah, remember. They, they've done a ton of they, the the, the Trifork company now is more about uh, uh, consultant company, and they do they own the uh, what was called Yahoo, but it's now go to. Um, ah, okay. You no, know, so Chris Chris actually wrote. He he and I was actually on the same product doing. Uh, Medical journals with uh, we, I, I was working on the the Metfork uh, company, which used the Trifork application server, and Chris was on that uh, product, and he also uh, uh, so I did I helped. There was a lot of the Trifork was doing heart reload stuff uh, when mm -hmm. before heart reload was more, uh, popular, um, and uh, he was actually helping uh, on my the, the product. I was an architect for uh, medical systems. Um, so yeah, we've had, we've had, uh, fun times and yeah, we were, and I was actually doing, um, the two things I was doing there, I, I, again, I got the gig there because on my last year I became, uh, I asked, uh, I sent a letter to Tri uh, Trifork said, Hey, you have this conference coming up. Um, could we be student help and, uh, help you and then see some of the talks. And that was actually, that must have been back in 1990. Six or seven or something. Whoa. Okay. Um, or eight. Uh, yeah, ninety-eight maybe. Ninety-eight, ninety-nine. And then uh, we got there, and I saw, got to see Ken Beck talk about extreme programming for the first time in 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 Denmark, I think. Um, and uh, uh, Ruby, I heard about Ruby. Uh, this was before Ruby and Rails, and it was like uh, the mm -hmm. guy behind Pragmatic Programmer was at those conferences, and I was like, oh, this is awesome. And then I got, I got connected and we got a student job, me and a, a, a student colleague. Um, and we got our first laptop, a Dell um, laptop. Mm -hmm. And I started writing uh, a lot of Python for, because they had their whole development tool was uh, a, a Python, ED, it was called EDP. Uh, e, uh, a Trifork? A Trifork? Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so this was like Trifork before that was called EOS, and they they had this the the guy who founded it the was a Python head kind of thing, and okay. he had this. Uh, it was just Python. And the only thing that Python did was just uh, sorry, the, the the tool do was like in in the root of the file was being a list of the dependencies you need. So this is before Maven, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it was like, oh, I need I need a pat <clears throat> I need Apache uh, Maven, I need uh, Tomcat, or I need these libraries, and then we uh, had a server somewhere. That had these like every product with a version, and then we'll go fetch it and put it on your disk, and then in your Ant stuff you could then put it in. And before Ant, there was like a Java C uh, setting up the class box. It was like a pre pre anything mm -hmm. uh, development tool set. So I did the, I did all the the Python there. I, they were Emacs was the main IDE, so I was doing all the the Lisp extension for I was doing stuff to Java developer toolkit in in, in Eclipse. Uh, sorry, Eclipse uh, in Emacs. And uh, 
And then my real job <laughs> was to to write this um, uh, Swing app for um, uh, there was talk the Swing app that was talking to Trifog application server to do these medical uh, different ca applications. But well, the Trifog so application server that was actually a really thin and fast server. So I was really amazed. It was it was. Yes, it was very different than anything else. Yeah. It was uh, the, the the issue they did was they were not doing the open source part. Like this, a lot of stuff that JBoss did, uh, Trifor did in in some way before. Like, but yeah. it, it just had, wasn't really um, known. Um, so that that was uh, yeah, no, that was an an amazing uh, server. Mm -hmm. um, so that was that was really fun. <laughs> really fun. Um, so so you worked and, as a student for Trifor. So this was the next gig. Yeah, so I, I, I do work for students at, at, at Trifark, and then I got uh, fully hired into so the, the the two of us, uh, uh, me and another guy called Klaus. Klaus got hired into Trifark and working on the app server. I got hired into the Metfork, who was working on applications that was running on top of the app server. That's cool. And and that that's so that's 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 how I got into that gig, um, and. Uh, yeah, and the, the the thing was the 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 funny story for for the Trifog area about the go to and Yahoo was the two thousand one September eleven, which is my birthday, by the way. Uh, I was in Aarhus, so, and we saw our internet go crashing down when, and we heard this thing about, uh, oh, something flew into the World Trade Center, mm -hmm. uh, and this was the last day. Of the Jau, uh, Java ja Java conference, the mm -hmm. Jau conference. So mm -hmm. there was like, yeah, Ken Beck and uh, the private, private program, and all those like fifty of some people from the from outside, and they were just. I remember that they were crashing in. The internet just stopped working, <laughs> and we saw these screen come on, and then there was like you know World Trade Center coming down, um, and uh, yeah, that was the that that was a fun. Oh, not fun, but. Uh, it's just a, a memory from back then. Um, just seeing, I remember seeing then the page. They they had this, you know, <laughs> back then website, mm -hmm. uh, very basic, <laughs> but it, they had to turn it even more basic for to handle the load. Mm -hmm. It was the first time where people were using the internet to get their news, so um, that was fun. Um, but anyway, yeah. So I wrote those medical um, uh, journal apps, a lot of swing, did a lot of teaching. Um, uh, and coding, and uh, part of that, I did a lot of persistence. So all through this, I always had fun with databases. Uh, okay. Database always fascinated me. Um, I, I've written uh, several weird layers of persistence on top, of, like wrap different things in, um, and we kind of needed something. So we, we were using raw JDBC at the time. We had our own little library, but it was just like it felt like too hard to 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 get nearby. And I was looking for stuff to to see if I can find something better. And I remember I, I looked at different things, but the one I remember was Apache ODB. Mm -hmm. um, and it Object Relational like, Bridge. This, yes, that kind of thing. And it worked great. It was like it had this like nice API with some thing called a session, and you load the thing in, and I was awesome. I was like, let's do this. Let's make it in. It worked great on my computer. And then when we actually started writing it, and the first time we had to be two users on a like going through the servlet and accessing things mm -hmm. uh, and had separate, separate separate transactions was when I realized, at least at that time, that ODB in the VM had a shared state between all the threads. Mm -hmm. So like you can think in, in Hibernate DPA terms, the session was basically shared between everyone, yeah. independent on what transaction they want. So that was a mess. And I remember... Writing and talking. This was uh, uh, an RSC or Salesforce, uh, uh, what's it called, uh, SourceForge. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, or was, I just remember talking back and forth with the lead of this thing. I was like, "Guys, you, you, you're doing this wrong. Like, this is not how it's supposed to be." And I remember, no, no, it's the uh, the answer was coming back. Like, no, no, when you're in the VM, you want to have you want to have the latest state, and if you want to do separation of concerns, um, you should use something else. Because okay. they, they believe that it was better. It was, I just remember it was just weird, and I was like so frustrated because I, I already built. We spent a few weeks on this thing, and then when we actually go concurrent, you know, it yep. worked great in the unit tests. <laughs> um, and this and is why I always tell you no. Forget forget about unit tests. You should uh, as early as possible you no know, have system <laughs> and stress tests because then you see whether that, it's actually that, working. 
that that is true. That is true. Um, uh, and then then so then then um, I remember looking around, and this again, this was you know early days of of internet basically, um, <coughs> or real like uh, worldwide internet. And I saw this weird page, which was it has it like hibernate blue Mars dot net or something. Uh, it was like hibernate zero seven or zero eight, and I had this like single page explaining what it did, mm-hmm. and it just ticked all the boxes. Like I, uh, you know, sim like objects should not uh, like a lot of the the systems require you to extend the suck bus, mm-hmm. um, or do something like well, it's weird, and I didn't like it. It was it was not clean. And and this one was like a podio, like position your podio. Um, I think Hibernate like the first one had a base class, but in the next one they we, we removed it. Uh, and but the thing is, it understood transactions, like how transactions should be. Mm-hmm. Uh, one thing led to another. I, we tried a thing. I was like, hey, this works. And the tooling, uh, there was some basic uh, schema generator stuff that was incomplete at that time. So I started contributing to the the thing that takes your schema and then generate the database. Mm-hmm. I started uh, then generate looking at we had a la- large existing database and I want to reverse engineer it uh, into mapping files. And so I wrote the first version of like uh, the HPM to something, uh, DDL mm-hmm. and the HPM to, uh, to DDL, DDL right. to HPM. Mm-hmm. all those things and. Um, and some uh, suddenly I was the maintainer of the the thing that is now called Hibernate Tools. Um, and uh, wow, I, so, I so you became this... committed earlier, right? <clears throat> yeah, I was I uh, the fourth or something, third or fourth. Uh, so there was like uh, Gavin King was there and Christian Bauer, and then um, a guy called David in Australia, and then uh, um, I came on board uh, being committed on, on on the core. And I actually again comes back to Trifork. The the first place that Gavin ever gave a talk uh, was at Yahoo in Aarhus in two thousand and there was nine yeah, in the either ninety nine nine or two thousand and two. I can't remember which. Okay. Year, probably. Um, and uh, yeah, he gave his first talk about uh, having it uh, there. I really enjoyed um, uh, Gavin's talk. <laughs> they were not always politically correct, you know, uh, but this was... <laughs> no, they are, they, are, they are always fun. So yeah. That, that, was, yeah. Uh, that, that was good. But no, so we had our first Hibernate team meeting in my uh, in my, uh, my my room. Uh, it was the first time we actually met each other. So you've always been online, right? It was like for a, maybe a year or two. Uh, and they accepted there. you immediately as a committer or, you know, there, there was like, uh, what was they, the... So Gavin is always like, he, like if someone shows up and does something, he's literally just, you know, he, uh, I can't remember how, when I got commit access, but he was very active. He was in Australia. I was, I was working weird hours in Europe. So we were talking in, in my morning and, and my late evening and just, you know, walk through and he accepted the, I forgot how he actually, did. it must be like CVS or something. I can't, it was horrible, but, yeah. um, and then I, I, we just got commit access fairly, fairly, you know, early mm-hmm. uh, in there, and uh, yeah. So that that was uh, that was the, the yeah that was again it was like the opposite of of um, <laughs> trying to figure out how programming works. Yeah, <coughs> yeah. <in> the <coughs> and um, and the thing is, I still couldn't really understand the internals of Hibernate. Uh, Hibernate's in terms are it's called interesting. <laughs> Yeah. And it was actually not until so I was doing all the kind of stuff around the stuff I understood, like reverse engineering, the schemas, and mapping and stuff. And then when we had that team meeting, oh, when we had that team meeting back in 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 Denmark, was actually the first time Gavin stood up and explained to me and Christian and a few others like how the persistent loader and all that stuff worked mm-hmm. uh, inside Hibernate internals, and that was actually what triggered that. So at that time, Hibernate couldn't do anything that, well, it could do a lot of good things, but it couldn't do like SQL queries. It was all HQL mm-hmm. um, on top. And I was always like, ah, you know, what? I, I like SQL. It's nice it's all, but I have all these existing SQL queries and I have all the DDBAs and stuff we have. They they, they, they understand this better. And I was like, why can't I um, uh, use native SQL? And, and Chris, uh, 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 Gavin Disable, Let's let let me re refactor the how the loader works, and so it can we can hook in an alternative translator, 
And that made us create the what's now called Create, S create SQL Query or Create Native Query in JPA now. That was the, the early days of that. And that was that, was, that, that was the first major thing as outside the tools. Uh, that was the first major thing I made into uh, to uh, Hibernate. Um, so yeah, so every time you do a create a skull query and stuff, it's probably running some micro in the uh, in Hibernate. Hey, dude, this is so, actually yeah. incredible. And this was still yeah. at the uh, at, at Trifork. Uh, yes, this was the stuff I did. Yeah. So the fun thing is, I actually did all this stuff for Hibernate, and I never made a like. My pro the products I was working on was using like they were older has legacy stuff in it, and using my old persistence library I did at the time. Uh, but the years I was there, those like four years I was doing uh, a try for uh, the the a Medfox thing, and then that company got acquired by IBM. Uh, sorry, another company called uh, anyway. No, the four years they, they got acquired, and in that time I never actually did Hibernate in production. Like I was always just a contributor. And I have all my teammates who are working on new projects mm -hmm. who got to work on these things. But I was help. I was telling like you should try this hybrid thing because it's, it's doing the right thing. And and at that time, I remember a guy who's very pissed, not pessimistic. He was like, "Eh," I said, "Like just give it a try." He tried it, and then he he found a bug like DB two some weird thing. And I said, "Open an issue." And he was like an afternoon of mine, and then the next morning, like. Me and Gavin had worked on the fix, and it was just done. And then people were like amazed that hey, we could get a fix into our enterprise software without paying and with time. And and it was actually a there's a person on their team who understood the technology. Mm -hmm. And then of the it just kind of highly got started, got using everywhere. Yeah. Um, and your Met Metfork then, thing, yeah. what which which what what you actually, what, what was the software? So it managed what? So what what was it? <clears throat> what was so, it? Uh, so electronic medical journal. So uh, the first one was like uh, keeping track of your name and date and what you like. You get into the hospital and they do this screening and saying like, what did you do? How do you like? What fail? What uh, diagnosis should be done? Um, but the one I spent most time on the last two, the two or three years was actually uh, medicine, like keeping track of medicines. So this was a uh, you know have a storage of all the different kind of drugs you have and how they interact. So like don't take drug X with this because then you get blue spots or die or something. Okay. Um, and, and, and just keeping track of that. And then uh, having a system where you can, again, visually show, like, so the doctor can go and say, hey, I want to give two drops of this every four hours. Okay. Like the, the, this kind of uh, planning thing. Um, and then be able to take all those data and visualize on a, like a drug table or you call it. A table that the 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 staff that the nurses can then use to see when they need to give it, mm -hmm. and then keep just keep track of all that stuff. And it, it was really like it was like um, what I liked about it was the fact that whatever I wrote here was helping people not dying. It was kind of so that was the way. Okay. Um, that, that was that was really uh, you know that was that was the thing that that gave me the 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 will like <laughs> the will to show up every day. It was like oh uh, this is actually helping. Yeah. Cool. Um, and then, uh, yeah, like three, four years in, the, uh, Ga Gavin got hired by uh, Mark Thurry in JBoss. 2003, I think, early 2003. Um, so him and Christian Bauer went there and, 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 and worked there. Um, and I remember I never heard about, well, I had never heard about JBoss and that stuff before. Um, but for a year, they were, they were building that up and, Steve Ebersol got hired in the U.S. because they needed a U.S. presence. And then uh, I came in when they needed the uh, European presence. I got asked, hey, do you want to go and, and, and work for this company startup? And I was like, oh, okay, let's see. And uh, I was like, oh, we want you to be in um, in Switzerland. And I was like, okay. <laughs> that, was, that was a bit far away. But uh, I, in, in a joke, I said, hey, you know, Gavin's had this gig I can do. But we have to move to Switzerland and in the French speaking part. And I thought she would say no, but he said, okay. And I was like, okay. And then we went to Switzerland and hanged out with uh, Sacha Labore, who's the CEO of, of CloudBees now, and um, uh, ha had a fun time. And I got hired. And then I started. And the first thing I did was show up in Atlanta for uh, the first JBoss uh, team meeting, uh, a company meeting uh, in. 
2004. Yeah. Okay, so speech, they, 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 they speak uh, French right now. Uh, I speak. Uh, I don't. I'm. I'm very embarrassed. I speak. I speak enough to be dangerous. Okay. Uh, but I, I'm not. I understand what people are saying. Uh, I can speak it, but not not as much. As I, I definitely should. Because okay. literally, I've worked here, and uh, the language I only use French when I'm outside my house. Okay. Like like at at work or anything. Then then there's no French. Okay. Um. So I yeah I I do yeah I I can. I can speak. I can speak well, Danish, English, German, uh, and French. But every new French word I learn, I lose a German word. So, oh, okay. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> so this is the uh, uh, French-German balance, right? Yeah. Some. Yeah. That's, uh, <laughs> so. In, okay. So um, and, and then um, so so you kept doing what you are doing right now, right? So almost no different. So you just uh. Well, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, for I uh, that came uh, Hibernate Tools, and then um, we did the thing called JBoss IDE, um, and uh, later became JBoss Tools. But I think like a year in to year or two in when uh, uh, Red Hat acquired JBoss, uh, like a year or two after. Mm -hmm. um, we got uh, this, they, they wanted to do like, JBoss was very much into getting IDE and Eclipse was the, the thing. I remember evaluating, uh, like through all this stuff I've been doing, like I've done plugins for basically every IDE on the planet in some form, like either experimental or actual, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, actual doing something. Um, and uh, no, sorry, I did the, I started doing uh, Hibernate tools and it was, uh, uh, I moved it to Eclipse rather than just a standalone swing app. And um, we got this company called Exadel uh, that was doing this, uh, what was it called? Uh, Rich Faces, the JSF uh, mm -hmm. library. We were doing a lot of the seam thing. JSF was a, was a new, new, new awesome thing. And they had this visual editor for JSF and a bunch of other things in the Eclipse tooling. And I remember I got a call for Gavin at point saying, hey, we, need, we have this thing, the company we're looking at. Can you go to, um, uh, you know, that must be Musk. I had a Musk call, Belarus. I had to go and check, like, how does this work? Like, is this like is, is software something you can use and that kind of thing? Uh, due diligence, so it's called. And uh, so I went there and I saw the Excel stuff. Um, uh, a lot of good things. A lot of you know, it was a big code base. Mm -hmm. um, and then we partnered with the company and we got the technology. And we hired uh, the contract that team, and I became the team lead of, of, of what was called JBoss EIE at the time, but then be JBoss Tools in the community product. And then over the years, we built up this thing and, and created JBoss Developer Studio, which then became Red Hat Developer Studio, which then became uh, Code Ready, what it's called now. Um, and I did that uh, for 10 years. So for 10 years, I did any kind of tooling or developer experience. In JBoss middleware, I I was kind of leading the the, the technical uh, side and delivery, and then you know we have a bunch of people in in JBoss and and the different teams that are doing it, and I was just kind of coordinating and getting that released and and being sure the features in Basic Clips was there, and one thing led to another, and we actually got I uh, was on the Clips board for uh, a few years, as the I got Red Hat became a strategic member, um, and then. Ten years in, uh, I touched basically every middleware part from a tool perspective in some way, and then I kind of said, "Hey, I should try something else." And then Red Hat did um, this thing called Red Hat Developer, uh, developer.com, and they wanted to create uh, some tool chain uh, online. Uh, so I actually handed over the reins for the developer tools and started working on the team of, of that time called OpenShift.io. Uh, which then led into stuff like um, I was acquiring Eclipse J, um, do a lot of the stuff around the language server. So the language server that's used in, in VS Code for Java, mm -hmm. uh, I helped kick off. Mm -hmm. um, so Gorkum and Fred and those guys um, did the hard work. And then, um, uh, yeah, so now that team has now uh, you know, grew and did all this tooling, all this object communities for, for two years. And then I took a break for a year. <laughs> I literally just said, 
Okay, I delivered the stuff and then I took a I, I took a year off. Okay. Like, not doing anything. Um and uh and that was awesome. I got to travel and had fun and I spent a lot of time again with Python. <laughs> okay. Because uh, I got I was got I was getting frustrated with Java. Like when Java nine came out, I felt that was like the because I was doing all like all this tooling around Maven and, and Gradle and Eclipse and IntelliJ and all that stuff. And then Java nine with the model system came in. That was literally the worst. Like that was just there was so much stuff, so many assumptions and behavior that that broke. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I was like, okay, I, was, I literally said, fuck it. I was like, no, <laughs> I, I need to try something else. Um, and uh, I got to play with Go. And I, I really like Go for the simplicity. Um, but, uh, yeah, no, the, 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 so, and the cross compilation stuff, so the native stuff. Um, but again, I, it was just, it, it, it just frustrated me. We had to give up. There's a lot of stuff you don't like. You go to go and you lose a lot of stuff. Java has a very like massive ecosystem thing, yeah. and, and mm-hmm. Go just doesn't have the the, the same thing. They ha- it ha- definitely has some power. Um, no, so I took a year off and I I didn't touch a computer for uh, uh well because I left in July 2018 and October 2018 was when they announced IBM, Red Hat was buying IBM, so mm-hmm. I had to look at my computer again. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and um yeah, so I actually but I actually took up Python and I did some home like a thing called home assistant for automation of uh IoT devices mm-hmm. and I, I decided to write a CLI for that. So I spent yeah, that year was ma- I was mainly coding Python and actually enjoying being back to a language that was you know, more uh, dynamic and, and uh, no there's no compiler phase and that kind of thing. It's just it was a it was a joy to play with. Yeah, so you um, so you know are perfect with formatting, right? So you are the best formatter yeah, well, in the world. Yeah, so that's <laughs> that, but that's that's the thing is that Python, like one of the things that Go did, like this is the st- probably the most stupid thing I'll say, but one of the things that Go did was it it kind of legalized uh, formatting in your build process, like mm-hmm. Go for, Go FMT, right? So mm-hmm. any Go program automatically formats with Go FMT. So there's like even if you type random like index whatever wrong. It will format for you. So mm-hmm. Python actually has that toolchain now. So you can actually, you just run the. It will actually fix lots of the indentation for you. Mm-hmm. And there's a type. There's a you can add a type system to it. Mm-hmm. So Python actually can get fairly good at type checking and and uh, at least it good enough to not uh, feel as as wild west as we might be. So mm-hmm. um, no, it's I have no problem with that. I uh, YAML. I don't have a problem with it either. I, I can get upset, but I know how to fix it. Yeah, um, a, a question regarding uh, um, back to your to your to your swing swing background. So I yeah. also did some swing, and uh, then you know the Eclipse RCP and SWT and uh, just took off, and some project asked yeah. me you now to help, and I look at that and I say you are all crazy. So no way, I I, I really don't like yes. it. I, so uh, so I was just I, about <laughs> your because I mean you you are an Eclipse contributor, but I have to say I never got you know. People were excited at conferences talking about SWT, the Eclipse plugins, and and I look at that. It's like this is this is incredible. This is like you know nineteen nineteen fifties in in Java or so what you are doing there. What was your reaction to the SWT and 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 and, and, and the whole it, Eclipse? It's uh, I I don't want to upset some of my colleagues. Who are no, some, this is a just private it. conversation. But, you know. No, no, no. It's <laughs> part of it. Sure. Uh, no, I I I was I I literally I wrote uh, like uh, extensions to to Swing. Like I made a tree table and I made like. Mm-hmm. Uh, Layouts and process yes, controls. Same here. On, on yeah. Quick. It was awesome. Right? Yeah. But it got slow in the tooth. Like it, it, it was not fast enough. And then well, the, the, the part that Eclipse did right was at the time, by choosing to go native, yeah. uh, they, they got a leg up. Like, and they could, they, they, at that time, this is when, when Windows 95 and 98, whatever it's called, and had these new things like sliding up slide out and 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 a, and a more flat look mm-hmm. and it swing never like it took them years to catch up yeah um but the program model in swing i much is so much better yeah um uh but i must say like the the thing you can do with, with SLT, you can hook more native in and uh if they actually maintain it if they actually had continued SWT. And continued investment, it, the 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 way they've done it actually allows them to do it on other platforms. So, 
uh, and on iOS, they could have done the same thing, but because of the whole closed garden thing there is in those in mobile, that never uh -huh. uh, happened. So, so it, it's odd, but yeah, I don't. I'm not a. I, I did a lot of of of, um, of uh, SWT, but uh, or more like J Face, which is more like Swing is, yeah. uh, which is a problem. Uh, but yeah, it, it's not. Yeah, but it's just, but it's like a, you you kind of accept the funkiness in this OT because you get the benefit that is yeah, more... Yeah, this is what I absolutely get. But no one said it at conferences, yeah. no? Everyone, took, like, it, they were absolutely excited about SWT and JFace. And I took a look at this. It's like, yeah. this is a bunch of constants and you have to know, know in which order to in the, to to, to uh, or them. And this was like, like uh, what's going on here? We are in Java, not in uh, Assemble, you know? Yeah, no, it, it was... Uh, yeah, it's... Uh, yeah. But and, that's a, the fantastic part. Like, those, those years was the fact that we actually had a, pl a platform where a majority of other companies was contributing to tooling was amazing. Like this was actually like, uh, there was a lot of synergies and, and, and like we could align to each other and, and get them to, to, to match up. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, the, the problem was that IBM who was hosting a lot of the club stuff and put it at the foundation. Um, they didn't, understand the fact that when you have people showing up who has a passion and will to do a fix don't let that fix rot for weeks and months mm -hmm. and if you do that and uh, in one with one way in one hand and then in the other hand you actually accept patches but doesn't make someone who keeps coming back a contributor then they will disappear and you end up having to maintain this code yourself Mm -hmm. And then your bosses will say, "Hey, why are you spending that much time?" Well, we have these communities with contributing, but they never. Well, they they did eventually. We, it was one of the things that we helped uh, get them to understand and work toward. Um, they it took a year or two too long for them to understand that that opening up they will have had more uh, more, mm -hmm. more luck. Um, uh, but now, for example, the fun thing is Eclipse. Like people are uh, are dissing on Eclipse, but the fun thing is that Eclipse is now used in uh, the language server, like if you're using VS Code or anything yeah. else, uh, it is now is literally Eclipse you're using. So this is this um, is the, the you know the the largest Java process process on my machine right now. The the language server. If I that, use that 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 is true, but it's yeah. also very good at what it does. <laughs> but but it's still it's still smaller than your Slack process, right? Yeah, I don't have Slack, Slack, but uh, if so, if I no. Uh, if I uh, did some uh, you know uh, Corcus stuff or uh, or Open Liberty Wi-Fi. And if I uh, yeah. open up the you know the uh, activity monitor, people suspect you know the largest process is the server. No, it is always the Visual Studio Code, and no one believes this. You know, so I kill Visual Studio Code, which kills the server, and then just you know yeah. the the tiny Java <coughs> application server show up. So this is actually a funny yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah, no, it's it, yeah, but it's funny. I I've gone through all the battles of people dissing and stuff. Like, but the thing is, Eclipse, the JDT stuff, is actually an amazing piece of technology. Mm -hmm. All open source. It's the fastest compiler there is. It's the mo it's incremental. It ha it's fault tolerant, and it scales way better than uh, a lot of other tooling. Like uh, like right now, I'm I'm doing a mix of VS Code, IntelliJ, and Eclipse. Eclipse is the one I use when I need to browse and understand big code bases. Mm -hmm. Where I'm more in, in VS Code for for sm smaller things, mm -hmm. and IntelliJ because IntelliJ has more of the new. It's better to do like uh, if you have stream debugging and that kind of thing, so I, I'm I'm kind of using all 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 three, um, but Eclipse is still like like when you look at it, all the people are complaining about it was taking up this memory and that stuff. It's it's not. It's like compared to what no no does, I'm not complaining small. about memory at all. No no, but I, mean, people I, I know I know you I know I know you understand it, but I also know, like it's it's uh, it's just funny all the battles we had. Um, I don't get the whole uh, discussion so. about memory, no, because it's a, if you're already complaining about memory. You should not complain about everything, not just you know uh, Java, or whatever. And everything yeah, else is it, a, a lot larger yeah. than what we are but, doing, yeah. even though a Chrome is a is a, is a huge or something like this, right? Yeah, but it's actually exactly, exactly what the thing is that by now, uh, is that what what we didn't realize, or what let's say industry, you know, they always complain about it was the memory that was a problem. It's the problem with Eclipse is not memory. It was that. You you perceived it as Eclipse being slow because it it uh, it tried to do a lot of things in the background and took a little time to come up. Mm -hmm. Where uh, 
NetBeans, for example, doesn't try and understand the world. It just uses external tools like mm -hmm. Java C and lets mm -hmm. it run the background. It, it, it's like a, like a glorified uh, coordinator. Mm -hmm. um, and, and what VS Code did right was um, it, again, do, it doesn't try and load up the whole uh, understanding. It lets it be up to these language servers. It runs in a separate process. And if they go uh, haywire, you can just kill that one, and the IDE still continues to to work just fine. And what I remember, uh, I don't conference. I use NetBeans with Glassfish, and I and I just you know deployed everything on the fly. And I remember people came yeah. to you, and you and you come back to me how it works, and we had a short chat because uh, you wanted to have something similar with Jebus IDE. You remember that? This was like I don't yeah, know. yeah, it's a lot. No, it's like this is like when I realized the difference between the strategy in Eclipse and other IDEs is like they they delegate to the tools, and yes, they can't get the full understanding. But they could get enough for you to be productive. Yeah, which is the key point, right? Yeah. So that was that when uh, that kind of clicked for me um, was when I started all our tooling. Oh, this this is a long time ago, but like nine, ten years ago, I, <clears throat> I I I kept realizing, hey, yeah, we should just delegate to these tools. So um, <clears throat> uh, it's also a good thing because, for example, my biggest uh, pet PV for IDEs is like if the plugin comes in, then the plugin start using the core logic. So for example, the Jules plugin we had for years mm -hmm. um, was actually embedding Jules inside it. And that meant that when Jules updated, it also had to update the plugin. Mm -hmm. And that meant that the plugin was tied to the version mm -hmm. or very near. So that meant that like, uh, and I kept explaining like, guys, you realize if we, if our IDE, if when we upgraded to Java, that it said, oh no, no, you have to use a different IDE depending on which version of Java you're using. We will be frustrated. Mm -hmm. right? So, the the strategy that is in Eclipse and, and uh, other well, IntelliJ has the same thing. Um, is that you end up with this like it's hard to maintain. Uh, mm -hmm. But if you do this, what NetBeans does and VS Code does, you decouple yourself from this, mm -hmm. and it becomes much easier to maintain. Um, and that was that was uh, yeah, and that's that's what we've been doing a lot of in, in internally in Red Hat. Uh, Another thing which so you mentioned, what I wanted to come um, back to, is the you know the Java module system. And uh, oh. I spend a lot of time in <laughs> a lot of time in uh, business projects similar to to yours probably even. And then you know the Eclipse yeah. took off RCP and then all conferences. And the problem is all the conferences, the speakers, yeah. and all consultants go out and talk about uh, funny stuff which is uh, partially applicable, I would say, to real world projects sometimes. Yes, and uh, yes. Eclipses came out, you know, with the plugins. And this was similar discussion to microservices right now. So, and, and then yeah. we were more or less forced in projects to use plugins. And I remember in one of my projects, you know, a huge <laughs> company, and uh, I was like the external architect and designer and coder in, in one person, more or less. And there was one uh, internal architect. And he wanted to have plugins. Yeah. And I didn't saw the point yeah. because we had to, you know, to release the software at once. There was no concept of, you know, loading something on demand or partial functionality. There was just, you know, there was one piece of software without yeah. any conception of, you know, uh, algorithms or filters like in Photoshop or something like this. This was just, I couldn't see yeah. this from the business perspective. And he said, okay, yeah. how many plugins do we have? I said, there are three. We have a front-end, back-end, and a <coughs> test plugin. I said, no, 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 we cannot do this. No, there's monolithic. You are just, you know, completely, your point of view is completely wrong. And I said, okay, yeah. how many plugins you would like to say, just give me a number and we will charge you per plugin, let's say, you know, uh, two days. And I will I will name the plugins, plugin one to 20, or you give me uh, no reasonable names. And the guy hates me to yeah. now. If he see me, no, he cannot stand me. And, 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 and I have to say, in none of my projects, I saw you know the point of plugins until in one project I had a conversation with the guy who uh, won the uh, Duke Choice Award. I forgot his name. He created satellite software with uh, NetBeans RCP, uh, and yeah. uh, and he said, "Okay, we had satellites, you know, a signal, and we have many plugins which are contributed by the community, and these plugins uh, can process the signal, so we can load, you know, the algorithm. Say, okay, this is." the single use case I know right now, which makes sense, or Photoshop. And uh, similar you know, story to microservices, just deploy 100 and uh, and everything is going to be better without conception what they actually are, you know. And uh, yeah, yeah. The, 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 the next thing is OSGI. So then I got a lot of no fire from the OSGI guys because I say, I don't see the point, you know. OSGI for me makes only sense if I have the use case where I would like to know dynamically load something and have different release versions 
or um, they say, uh, yeah. yeah, but your software becomes you no know, monolithic. It's like, I don't care. If it's fast and it's simple, yeah. I will build monolith, yeah. period. Yeah. And then no, Java I, 9 I, came I, out, yeah. then Java 9 came out, and now the entire discussion stopped. So, I mean, I, 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 the whole, you know, no one uses neither OSGI, no plugins, no Java 9, except in tooling. So you are a complete different world as me, you know, because in business, we don't have such yeah. a, a, in tooling, if you're building platforms, OSGI, Java yeah. 9, they are a must. You cannot just build monolithic application server or a runtime. You know, you cannot build Quarkus without just as a monolith. So it it, it won't won't fly. So you need something. No, like no. That. A, so we don't. You know, we don't use neither OCI. Or yeah, yeah, no. But you have a concept <laughs> yeah. of uh, yes. concept of modules at least, you know, or extensions. It's this is mo- yeah. It's yeah. Extens- yeah. Yes, it's mo- it's monolithic, right? And yeah. That, but that's the thing is this this caught me. This took me actually years to actually realize. So the OCI came out and and. It was coming from these embedded devices, and and their actual modulation makes sense because they, yeah. then they can couple of things down and scale it down. And actually, so it, it it has some advantages. And I remember hearing these you know talks and and, and read about it like, oh yeah, you know we can separate because in Eclipse you are ba- you have both back end and front end like your logic like the compiler it shouldn't be tied to your UI code right because mm-hmm. you want to run, run the compiler separately. Uh, mm-hmm. In your ant process or Gradle and that kind of thing, uh, or oh, that's him, maybe. Uh, so it makes sense to have some separation, like modularizing, modularize, modularize, modularization. Yeah. Doesn't necessarily have to be dynamic, but just have a separation. And then they start going, well, the great thing we can separate the UI in the front end, and uh, you can modularize, and all this goodness that a modular system on paper gives you. Yeah. And I, I tried to write like I've, one of the reasons I moved uh, Hibernate tools to from the Swing ID to to Eclipse was this promise of bloggability and, and like I had like different databases I could see that stuff, but the thing is what they missed in Eclipse was that uh, OSGI has this like a service event bus, mm-hmm. which is the thing that allows you to decouple uh, the back end from the front end, mm-hmm. but in Eclipse, no. They, they they don't use that. So it's literally it's a plugin system. So you literally load up like you merge the class loaders and you load them up, and it's a static dependency. Mm-hmm. And that means again you get the coupling you talk about like, like why why are we doing this thing, and the fact that you could not just have multiple version of the same plugin just communicating mm-hmm. uh, because it was just it was actually, actually at runtime it was coupled it, it mm-hmm. was not modelized. Mm-hmm. And it took me a little bit. Right? It's like, oh, we're missing that key part mm-hmm. in um, from OSI. And then when you go look at it, you end up being in a world that is very similar to microservices. Like it literally is a distributed system, and you have to decouple. And then you have all the problems with that. Yeah. Um, so again, it's it's I, I I love when you say like you tell people like just stop doing microservices because the monolithic is fine. Uh, only use microservices when it makes sense. And I'm 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 completely in the same uh, in in the same. Um, uh, canvas source. Yeah, uh, <laughs> actually, two, two, two days ago, I delivered uh, the first Airhex Live about uh, Quarkus, and they wanted to have microservices. And, oh, and, yeah. and uh, in the middle yeah. of the of the of the thing, I thought, okay, you can actually use Quarkus. It is small, and then just create a monolith. Let's say if the if the yeah. monolith you no know, deploys extremely fast, it's small. Who cares? You yeah. will win. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, imagine. No. You would create, you know, let's let's go extreme. This always, I think, this is always nice to see to go to 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 extreme direction to see what happens. Let's say you manage to put the entire company in one Quarkus bundle, and let's assume this Quarkus bundle, this Quarkus service <laughs> deploys in half a second or one second. Who cares then? Yeah. Right. Then there you have no problem. Of course, if this thing yeah. will deploy one hour, then we have to talk. But if it's incredibly fast, but- everything is fine and it, it consumes no memory. No one cares. So I would yeah. say, do the but, simple possible thing once, you know, ship it, and see what happens, measure, yeah. run some stress yeah. tests, and then break it up. They say, okay. Yeah. No, yeah. but that, I, I find it like a super, when, when this whole like, you know, oh, we have to like, Uber, like uh, ah, Google does it, Microsoft, uh, yeah. Google, Amazon, uh, Netflix, whatever does it. And then uh, like Facebook, oh, they also do, do it, but when you actually look at it, Facebook, they what they're deploying is a two gigabyte uh, PSP blob. Yeah, and that gets rolled out. They and they spent they instead of modernizing, they spent time on making the compiler faster, uh, make their distribution mechanism using peer to peer rather than 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 rsync. Mm-hmm. And by that, they they literally just they automated the heck out of it, so yeah. that the fact that it was a monolith doesn't matter. Yeah. Right? 
And yeah. that's, that's the thing is like, this is, this is, and this is awesome, right? And this is why I, when I talk about caucus, I am, uh, for me, it's, of course, I think it's great we have now a way to make a Java small and, 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 and great. But for me, the thing is that, for me, the benefit is the, the, develop, the dev mode, like the fact that we done all the stuff in build and we do changes. We, we, we are literally optimizing the, the build process mm -hmm. so that your development process and deployment becomes fast. Yeah, and, and I have yeah, to admit the, the dev tools is, uh, is nice, but uh, the Quarkus is so fast that I sometimes forget about, you know, the dev mode and I just do Maven <laughs> compile a Java minus jar. Sure. So I have sh a, sh a short script. Yeah. So yesterday, uh, yesterday, two days ago in the in the workshop, no one recognized that I didn't use the dev, uh, the, the, the dev tools, the dev mode, you know. No, and then I said, oh, I absolutely <laughs> forgot, you know, the showcase of Quarkus, the dev mode. So then I launch a Quarkus with the yeah. hot reload. It's like, okay, everyone was was uh, somehow delighted, but they, they saw, you know, the worst case first. What I did first, you know, Maven package, and then Maven. Yeah, but it takes a few seconds, right? So yeah, yeah this was like uh, yeah, just you know, deleted the tests, but, but and it, it takes that, one, like, one second or two seconds, so it doesn't matter. So no one recognized yeah. that actually. Yeah. And but, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's so funny because a, a big part of the stuff I did with that, the, the ten years development, was actually make sure that you can deploy to Wildfly, and uh, you know, JBoss and stuff incrementally, and do these updates very mm -hmm. uh, quickly. Mm -hmm. Uh, unfortunately, it, it was like it was only available in our tools. So you know, people uh, uh, started using more at Maven and Ant, you know, Ant, and then Maven and Gradle. Mm -hmm. So they, they never really got the, the full benefit of it. Um, but now, where we have it in tooling, I'm I'm like so amazed because now, like the to the runtime itself, also runtime the the framework itself is kind of built for making developers fast, life fast. Yeah. But uh, it was so fun when I. I, that was one of the reasons why I joined. Like when when I was on the, on the sabbatical, I I heard about project before it was named Quarkus, and I was like, okay, maybe if I go back, this would be the thing I actually work on. Uh, and that was mainly because of the whole dev mode and the whole like okay. all the stuff we can do there. We haven't even done all the stuff we want to do yet. Um, but the my what was really funny is the first time I actually went out and in I can't remember early uh, late last year, I was out with a customer and talk about Quarkus, and demo it. Uh, this was in a, in a big uh, corporation, and I showed the dev mode, and I saw how, like, I show how, like, see how fast this goes. Like, this is like, it takes milliseconds instead of like seconds. Mm -hmm. And they said, this is a great demo, Max, but by the way, like, you know, I, we think this is awesome, but, you know, uh, you had us when you said we could deploy stuff within minutes because they were, they were, they, like, they were used to, when they do stuff, it had to go through like several layers of security audit stuff. Before they can get to the cluster, the deployment of clusters. So their yeah. their whole perception of what is fast is like if things takes less than a day, that's fast. Yeah, I, I was like, just, I was so amazed. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> my so, my uh, short story about Quarkus. So um, so for me, uh, I use uh, Whitefly and Glassfish or Payara uh, and uh, Open Liberty. I would say yeah. uh, almost uh, no one third each. So probably P Payara and Whitefly more than the IBM. And um, yeah. and uh, they were for me always fast because, uh, as you know, my architecture were no dependencies, uh, thin wars. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I created yeah. a small tool uh, two years ago called uh, Watch and Deploy. What? And this is yeah. the most simple tool you can probably write. So what it just does, it uh, it searches whether there are time step changes in source main Java and source main resources, and on every change, yeah. it just does Maven clean install. That's all. Then you get the yeah, war, and, and it just copies yeah. the war to to all auto deploy folders I know on the machine. That's all. So it's like you know five classes, and it, but but the thing yeah. is, people suspect me that there's magic behind. So I got an AXTV. No. So how you replace the classes? I was like, there is no replacement. This is full deployment. This is the most simplistic. Go to GitHub. It is. Yeah. It just was my tool, and yeah. it is so fast that if I show Quarkus, no one is really impressed. Because if you do whitefly reasonable, it is very fast. Yeah. And I was yeah, at the no, at the at the Java yeah. One conference, the one of the last one, and there were the uh, Thonte people in my talk. I don't know whether yours attended, but they asked me, you know, about my opinion about Thontail. And I told them, sorry, but I don't see any use cases. So the, the whitefly is so small, whether I will shave over you know the 10 megs, no one is interested in it. We can talk about marketing. So the perception is whitefly is small, is, is slow, perhaps, but this is yep. not true. And um, yep. 
Yeah. And I was absolutely not interested in any, you know, micro frameworks, micro profile, whatever, until Quarkus came out. But this is, a, a, I would say, a topic for a different story because Quarkus is the first tool which, from my perspective, it just takes, you know, whatever was good in Java E and micro profile to the next next yeah. next generation. Next so level. they they, they yes. optimized everything and very consequently, and this is the first time I saw this. It's not like, you know, mini optimizations. They they did the right thing. You have, you know, the old APIs yeah. with completely, you know, rethought deployment process. And this is something really new and really modern. It, I was really amazed. Yeah. And I saw yeah. it from but day I, one. This was, okay, this is a completely different story. Yeah, no, but this is this is the, the, the part, right? This is when I, I was explaining about Quarkus, I, I focused so much on, because when, when I came uh, uh, back uh, in, in September last year, Quarkus was kind of known for, this is the thing that, that, that uses GraalVM to make native images. I'm like, yeah, it's no one cares about that at first. Yeah, like yeah. It, it is is awesome and amazing, but yeah. that is not the big thing. <laughs> but this is the most uh, important thing. What I do at the companies, yeah. I show them this first, yeah. and I see, look, the microservice yeah. will take ten max, and then the whole discussion yeah. stops about RAM and memory, you know, and then we can focus yeah. on the real thing. So this is the most important yeah. thing. You have to show it's possible, and then the whole bike yeah. shedding discussion stops, and then we can focus on the real thing. Exactly. Yeah. Right? And the thing is, the, 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 I'm not sure if you realize, but the, so the same thing we've done for for, for the like, like you said, it make the take the good parts of the APIs and make the deployment better, and and just generally just optimize the hell out of it. Um, the same thing we are we we actually do on the dev side. So that well, what I did, what what I did, I told you what I did at the at the workshop. Yeah. So uh, I created you know uh, an application with resource and request scope and injection. And then yeah. I just created some beans with request scoped, application scoped, which were injected, but not connected to the resource. So this was like, you know, isolated island of connected beans, managed beans. And then yeah. I ran the dev tools. And then what you see in the log, that Quarkus recognizes that these classes are not used and removes them. It marks them as ah, unused nice. beans. Yeah. And I say, That's look, good. this is what JavaScript uh, uh, calls tree shaking. We have it in Java. And um, That's yeah. yeah, I forgot yeah. to record. I will record a screencast on YouTube because uh, this is not that obvious. Yeah. That's, and the that's funny part is, yeah. you know, you have the classes in the jar, but they are not used. They are compiled, but they are not used. So the uh, the arc, this is the class, uh, the, yeah. uh, the the arc tool does that. And this is what I showed. And I call it tree shaking usually. And and this is unique. Yeah. And the reason is, I don't know whether you saw me other YouTube videos. If you if you run Quarkus with some micro profile extensions. It is smaller than Jetty or Tomcat, which are empty. So <laughs> right now, yeah, no, a, a, a loaded uh, Microsoft, yeah. a, a loaded microservice Quarkus app is smaller than an empty web container. Yes, because we we throw out all the stuff yeah, we don't. Tree shaking. Need, yeah. You, you, no, you, yeah. yeah, this is <coughs> that's true. That's true. It's, it's the same uh, same uh, same in principle. And the but the, the thing that I, I in addition to that is the the developer tool chain, right? So. One example here is that uh, we have these extensions that uh, so that can take part in the big thing is taking part in in, in uh, tree shaking and, and figure out which classes can be stripped out, etc. Uh, but it also can take part in the dev mode, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, for example, Liquid Base, you know, the the mm -hmm. tool for mm -hmm. uh, migrating databases, mm -hmm. um, uh, that default extension was or the web extension was contributed know, some months ago. Um, and, but then Stuart Douglas noticed that when you use Liquid Base, it takes 500 or something milliseconds slower to start up. And 500 mm -hmm. milliseconds for us is like an eternity. Mm -hmm. um, but the fact that he, but then we find out that the, the way it, it does the Liquid Base, in, in, it loads up its configuration file and then it generates SQL for every knowable database it has. Mm -hmm. So it knows about 10 databases. So it, it does the same thing 10 times. Mm -hmm. uh, which is pointless because you're only going to deploy for one. Yeah. Um, so without having to change liquid waves, uh, the extension in Quarkus now uh, orchestrates liquid waves to, oh, no, 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 you only have to reload if one of these resources has changed. And mm -hmm. when you reload, only generate for one database. And that means that now in, 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 in Quarkus, the, the, the liquid waves now is even faster. And uh, you can literally do a full data, data migration uh, doing your startup. Uh, and it just we can do the same thing with other tools, um, whether it's the hot reload or Hibernate or um, any other testing that that or, or Camel. Like the way uh, I don't know, have you tried using the Camel uh, plugins? 
I, I, I just look at them. I don't have a use case right now in my 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 projects, but uh, they look really yeah. interesting. So there are lots of but, hundreds but of camel the, projects, but, right? Yeah, and the thing is that the, the the fact that you can sit there and write code as you like looking at PHP and Node.js and just have it rerun the, your iteration and you just change your routes and your transformation and it just it's like in seconds mm -hmm. it becomes it it enables experimentation which is yes. the the thing that 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 I was missing in Java like I I remember it from back in the old days I could do experimentation in Java but now it's back like it's uh, yeah. that's the that's the thing hey Max so, I would uh, like to stop here. Yeah. And uh, re-invite you back okay. to talk exclusively about Quarkus and what you're doing right now. So this was like you no know, introduction cool. that uh, to understand sure. what, what what your actually uh, uh, topics are. And the next session okay. in a few weeks, if you like, I would like just to talk about well, that. Sure. Otherwise, we will spend you oh. know three hours talking about the great Quarkus stuff right now. And uh, sure. and uh, then we talk about Code Ready and whatever Visual Studio Code and uh, whatever we have, right? And uh, well, you should, you should, you should, you should. Have you tried JBang, by the way? How it's called? <laughs> you JBang. It's my side product. I created it over Christmas. No. It literally, allow, it literally allows you to write, um, uh, use Java for scripting. So cool. instead of having to deal with Maven or Gradle, you just write a single uh, li uh, like, like little, little, you know what? Like in Java ten or nine, they said, hey, you can have a single Java yeah, file yeah, and run it yeah. directly. Uh, but that thing doesn't support dependencies and arguments and all that stuff. So I just made that happen. Hey, so cool. J Bank is the name. J Bank. J is a bang. It's like She Bang, but yeah. J Bang with a J. Yeah. yeah, cool. So um, and uh, what, what else are your resources? Take, yeah. So so J Bang is is the sidekick here again. Uh, the the otherwise I'm Max Anderson on Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn. It's the same uh, name everywhere. And J Bank. Uh, and otherwise, yeah. And J Bang is uh, well, if you. Put it in Google. It's the first hit. It's GitHub slash Max Anderson slash JBang. Okay, cool. We'll take a look at this. So, uh, I'll I'll love to hear your thoughts on it. It's not it's not enterprise Java, but it it the, the fact since I've done it, uh, all the uh, the cutting scripts and Python scripts and other automation we've had, I've seen we've just kind of thrown out and used this instead because Java actually has all these libraries you can use and. Uh, yeah, yeah. Can, I, I do it. Yeah, I do cool. it for years. So I, I'm really looking forward into it because I miss using you know, yeah. Nason for that. So I use a similar. So I use Nason as a scripting language and uh, called Java from there. Yeah. And right now I'm yeah. using uh, Quarkus a lot, but Quarkus in, until now is not very good with CLI. So uh, I, well, I, I we think we fixed that now. Yeah, yeah, I know now, okay. but yeah. uh, I do it yeah. from the beginning, and then I know I created uh, the yeah. native libraries or even fed jars. This was the only reason to use fed jars, and they sit somewhere and they it, for automations yeah. on my stuff, lots of stuff. So I'm, I'm using yeah, but now if you fix that, perfect. Because Quarkus yeah. was really hard to kill, so <laughs> I, I was yeah. you had to know yeah, <laughs> yeah if it runs, I wanted you know to start Quarkus, do something and 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 and, and kill it, but this was not always oh, possible. Oh yeah, no. No, so we, we, we've had that now, right? And uh, one of the things, well, like I created JBack, so command line mode was one of the first things. When I heard about Quarkus, I wanted to do command line. Stuff. Yeah, like, me as well. To, yeah. Uh, on na uh, native stuff, right? Um, so I, I was pushing so hard on getting command line tools in, uh, and it's now there. And the cool thing is it has dev mode and all this stuff, but uh, we hopefully, I'm actually want to make the JBank stuff, I want to be able to call Quarkus apps. So Very good. Make, so, so, uh, it's yeah. JBang is completely separate from Quarkus, but there's they have the same. It's just making Java better, basically. Yeah. Um, and more accessible. So uh, yeah, I'll uh, give give it a try, and then yeah, I'll be happy to come back and talk about Quarkus. And if you like JBang, then yeah, uh, yeah. Thank you. That. So it was really fun to talk well, with you. Awesome. Yeah. Likewise. Bye. Thank you.